Welcome to the Scandinavian Mind Weekly, our show about the current trends and events within business, tech, fashion, design, culture, and more from the Nordic perspective of our team of editors and contributors. Today on the program, we talk about the highlights from Copenhagen Fashion Week, diversity, new talent, and NFTs. We also give a sneak peek about what's been going on at Stockholm this week during a joint fashion and design week. Also, a look at our upcoming special on digital fashion. A little bit of a teaser there from our upcoming issue three. I'm Conor Olsen, editor-in-chief and founder of Scandinavian Mind. And I'm here with my fellow editor, Erik Sedin, and our wonderfully talented intern, Martina Tedebring. Good morning, guys. Good morning. Good morning. Should be said that our uh, usual uh, panelist Roland, our editor at large, is off in the mountain somewhere this week. So we'll 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 have to do without him. Yeah, and what we ex- a substitute we, we got. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We <laughs> we expect a full report from the mountains next week. Um, no, it's wonderful, Martina. Uh, thank you so much for for uh, coming on the show. It's our n- next week is our last week with you. I can't believe what we will what, what we'll do without you. <laughs> yeah, it went really fast, actually. But we've done a lot, and I think it's been very fructiferous. Well, wonderful to hear. And also, we had the chance to uh, send you to Copenhagen last week, um, which from which you s- wrote a wonderful uh, rundown that's on the website right now. Eight highlights from Copenhagen Fashion Week. So I, I thought we'd just take the. We'll just let's just dive into it and talk about some of the things you observed there. Uh, uh, last week, where should we start? Well, basically, uh, something was that was very interesting about all the fashion week is that the COVID restrictions in Denmark lifted the day right. before uh, mm-hmm. or, or the same day of the fashion week it started. So basically, yeah. people was going crazy. Of course, everyone was very excited. You could tell that people needed uh, this because people was like full in every in every event. It was so much people everywhere. It was mm. so much people in the parties and it felt a little bit dirty in the beginning because you were like, well, we're in Sweden, we don't still have that freedom. So you were oh my God. But then after a while, uh, yeah, you see that people was excited about having the freedom again. Mm. And I don't mm. know if they did this with like purpose, that was the fashion week coming, but mm. it, I think it was actually a good time for it. Um, and then- yeah, That was the yeah. conspiracy theory, right? That there's some coll- collusion between fashion week and the, and the government. It's yeah. a, it, was a, you know, it was a great timing, though. Great timing exactly. to lift the restrictions. <laughs> exactly. But it's always like that, you know? I mean, people are always going to come up with some idea of something happening behind the backstage area. But anyways, <laughs> um, other thing that I thought was interesting is the person that actually opened uh, the shows was uh, Tobias Birk Nielsen. And yeah. he had his brand, Isopoetism. Um, and he actually won the Salando uh, Sustainability Reward. So uh, mm. so it was really cool that the first person that opened the shows uh, at all was the person that got this prize. Um, and it's basically a prize focusing on innovation and sustainable practices. His collection was very strong. It was like you, the, the models were working on a runway in this kind of like mountainy, mountainy area so to say with a lot of like cloud and it was a very cool set actually um and his clothes were very street but had like a very like earthy feeling to them so if it, it felt like kind of functionality was like putting it functionality and coolness was kind of the focus of the collection um mm. so do we know uh, anything uh, about the the sustainability textiles the the te- technology he's using Yep, actually, he uses uh, Korean textiles with fully recycled fibers, uh, mm-hmm. and he also has his own dyeing technique for the for the prints and stuff on the clothes. So I, I think he kind of developed his own technique of how to print the clothes and and lift them up a bit. I think uh, it was a really well executed collection. The colors were really interesting. Uh, it's a, it was very wearable. I think if it actually comes out to the market as a collection to sell, it's going to get very well sold. Yeah, I was going to say, when I yeah, saw it, I just re- immediately thought, like, I, I would actually wear that. <laughs> Sometimes when you see these, like, showroom pictures or whatever, like, whoa, the shows <laughs> get, get kind of crazy, you know, like, Virgil Abloh had, like, buildings on the on the shirt and stuff. You kind of you laugh <laughs> at them and then you share them because they're fun. But these ones actually looked really nice, but still being a bit spicy enough to, like, look cool. 
Absolutely. Yeah. Well, Tobias is also one of those talents that has kind of has been sort of brewing in the background at Copenhagen Fashion Week the last few years. Uh, so it's great to see that it's sort of coming to fruition and, and getting the, the, the recognition he deserves. All right, moving on. Uh, w- what else has been happening? What's, what's worth mentioning? Actually, something I noticed personally while being there is, ha- is like the diverse public in the mm. shows and also the, diverse, the diversity and inclusivity of the bodies, the ages and the ethnicities mm. of the models. And I thought that was fantastic because I think like, you know, when you still watch like traditional fashion weeks, you know, like New York and uh, I mean, Paris and stuff, you still see that like they still focus too much in like mostly white casts of models and mostly skinny mm. people of models. And the guests also are usually people, you know, the typical people that you see in fashion. And I think like in the Nordics, I think in, in Stockholm also it's kind of like that. Um, it's getting better. Like you can see, you know, it was a lot of young people actually in the shows um, and many people of color from different countries actually. And I had the, ch- the chance to speak to some of them. And um, and I think that's a really good thing because like when you have a diverse a diversity of people in an industry, there's something new on the table. And I think that's to be acknowledged and to be actually celebrated because I think that brings like different perspectives on well, it can be done in terms of sustainability, in terms of social responsibility. And I think that was very exciting to see, actually. And there was a talk uh, during this Fashion Week. Um, uh, between the, 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 there were many talks during the Fashion Week, but one was focused on, on this topic about, uh, it was a focus on mentorship and, and mm. on encouraging young designers and young uh, creatives uh, uh, that that, that belong to the people of color community to pursue their dreams and pursue their goals because there is a place for them in the industry. And I think they were talking about a lot how this actually benefits the companies because while having a diverse uh, diverse, uh, uh, amount of people in your company, then you have different visions of how things can be done, of course. And then like, you can also avoid issues or making a mistake by not knowing that you are making a mistake because someone is going to notice it if it's not yourself. Because, of course, you see things from your own perspective and maybe you don't think things a certain way because you don't have the experience of of the, the, the situation. But when someone else has the possibility, then this person, okay, guys, this is not really good. We should maybe do something about this or remove this from our business yeah, idea because yeah. it can be offensive and, and it's, and yeah, it's interesting to see how they're kind of taking a practical perspective on on this but obviously this is a you know diversity inclusivity it's a theme that's been going on for for several years uh but it's not it hasn't always been clear how to kind of move forward and i think a lot of brands a lot of people in the industry are sort of unsure of how to act how to move forward how to be more uh, you know inclusive so i really i really liked the, the angle of, the, of that talk with uh, who, who was in it uh, it was uh, adam ostadian binai uh, the ceo and founder of the soulfuls in denmark mika o uh, who is founder of denmark's Intersec- intersectional high school Mm-hmm. And Veronica de Sousa, uh, advisor and speaker for Gaze Agency, and Robbie Douglas uh, Westlin, uh, who is a creative director for the Swiss yeah. Fashion Council. So it was a very, very strong cast of people that actually have a lot of experience in this area. Actually, Robin himself, uh, he is doing a report on uh, diversity in Sweden, like in the Swedish. Uh, yeah, we've written fashion. about that before. W- were exactly. there other uh, uh, sort of takeaways from that talk that you remember, like practical tips to brands or on how to move forward? Yeah, they were talking a lot about, for instance, like internships and uh, possibilities of employment for people of mm. color, for instance, like, uh, because I think for me also that I'm still studying and I'm almost done with my studies, like when you look at internships, usually you cannot take too long internships if you don't have the means to basically survive without getting paid for it. And I think a lot of people from from minorities, you know, they don't come from like wealthy families from Sweden or Denmark or whatever. They come from second degree, I mean, second generation immigrants. And I'm a first generation immigrant. And I think it makes it harder for you to have the freedom to tell mom, you know, I need to do this internship. Can you cover me a bit? You, you don't really have that yeah. possibility. <laughs> so I think they were saying to like employers and companies, like we need to find a way to actually pay these people so they actually can develop their uh, talent and their knowledge and actually have a place in the table by getting experience and being able mm. to have the experience for the amount of time that is required. Didn't uh, the Christopher Morency sub 
Substack that we can highly recommend, by the way. I think he talked about this, how internships within the fashion industry is, like you said, Lina, if you, usually the guys that go to like these big brands and go to like, let's say you're going to another city, for example, you need to find somewhere to live, you need to have contacts, you need to afford it, first of all. And he was like, yeah, most of the interns at like these big brands, they're like, you know, daddy or mommy is paying everything. You know, exactly. it's, that's how they can afford it. It's really hard to you know, move city uh, and, you know, afford, uh, you know, subway tickets and everything. It's really hard. So I think that's really interesting. And I think <laughs> Morency spoke about that, how the interns uh, is a huge problem within the fashion industry. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. And I think the industry has been working this way for a long time. So I think, like, it's really hard to, you know, like, and also if we talk about nepotism, I mean, people that are already in the industry through family somehow get way easier access to be part of it and I think that can be problematic for people that just have the passion and the talent but don't have the contacts to start with and I think that's something that affects especially people that you know it's, it doesn't have like the privilege of being the right ethnicity or the right uh, social class so mm. I think it's, it's, it's interesting to see how, that these topics are being taken in account uh, at the executive level and at the uh, like public level when showing the models are diverse because people need someone to look up to. Okay, so moving on to other some other uh, brands that we're showing, what were some other h highlights that you uh, picked up on? I would say that actually uh, Jade Cropper was very, very hot. Like um, after the show, I saw her things everywhere, Instagram yeah. and it, it was like crazy. Everyone it's was hard to miss Instagram. if you followed the, the Instagram Absolutely. feed from Copenhagen. Absolutely, and I think her things are very interesting because she's she's a very new design designer. Like she started in 2020 her brand, and mm -hmm. basically um, she's part of the incubator program of the uh, Swedish Fashion Talents that is yeah. organized by the Swedish Fashion Council, um, and she I think she. Um, graduated from university quite recently, I think just a couple of years ago. Um, but her collection since the beginning have been sold, selling out uh, basically straight away when they have the, the collection out on her website. So I think she is very, very hot right now to, to follow her work and everything. Uh, and I think what is interesting about her designs is they're versatile, they're very like, they're deconstructed, but they're not boxy and, you know, like, genderless so to say i think for us from a woman perspective from a cis woman perspective i think sometimes i i love uh, this the construction fashion and like, avant-garde fashion but i think the mm. problem is sometimes you feel like you're too boxy and it, it gets too ambiguous so to say and i think she brings sexy back into this the construction <laughs> and i think <laughs> and, and it works you know because people are buying yeah, it and i've seen a lot of like big names you know celebrities and uh, wearing her things uh, internationally and it's because it's unapologetically sexy and I think was, that's what women want still, you know, like I think it, it, her clothes are very like empowering and and, and yeah, they're, they're great actually. So I yeah. really understand the hype about it. Well, it's also nice to see how, because uh, I know Swedish Fashion Council with uh, uh, Robin, the, the, the creative director there, which is a good friend, we've been working with him. Uh, quite a lot uh, in recent years, uh, how they sort of, you know, how hard they work with foster talent and how well they are helping the brands with, uh, you know, with, with execution and, you know, creative direction and helping them sort of, uh, you know, elevate to an international uh, level. So that's also very fun to see how, how, how they're doing that. And I think Jade is, is, uh, is an excellent example of that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and looking at there was also uh, some highlights from from Marimek looking at some of the bigger bigger brands. That was something you you picked up on as well. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, actually, I had the pleasure to assist to the exhibition that Rebecca Bay, who is a creative director for Marimek, mm -hmm. uh, and Trine Sodengard um, made because they had like a partnership where uh, basically. Well, basically, Rebecca found Trina's work, and they have a lot of focus on folk and uh, women, and mm -hmm. how in uh, female costume, you know, and culture. So I think the work will uh, work very well together because Marimeko also focuses a lot on that. Actually, Rebecca, in the event, talk about how uh, many m uh, patterns of Marimeko they have, uh, which is an archive of three thousand five hundred plus. Uh, 
patterns for the brand. So they also rework a lot with their own kind of cult, uh, like culture within the brand. Uh -huh. um, so um, and Trina focused on that a lot in, in her images because she's like a creative uh, visual artist that focuses a lot on photography. So they made this like a set, a set of photographies where uh, Trina covered the models with Manimeco fabrics and they were with the body and it, they were very beautiful images actually. Um, and Rebecca Bay is uh, the new creator of Marimeco, so she's bringing like a kind of new perspective to Marimeco, like because she used to work with Uniqlo and uh, other brands like that, that a little bit yeah. you know fast paced. So I think with Marimeco, she has ha had the like freedom to slow down a bit and doing things a little bit different because she's reworking uh, the brand identity from its own identity, so to say. So uh, the the collaboration was very interesting. Uh, it was a very well executed uh, project, actually, and it was the images were very beautiful, very very beautiful. Unfortunately, it, I don't find them online, uh, but I think probably they're gonna sh showcase them online soon. Yeah, yeah. It's it's my sense. It's interesting to hear your take on this, but it's my sense that the, the most many of the collection, not most, but many of the collections are really like expressive, and there's this great sort of. Uh, uh, thirst for patterns and and expressivity and like visual creations uh, among many of the uh, uh, the creators. You can see it here in Stockholm as well, and, and on the other international on the international stage, we've been talking about it in Paris and so forth. Uh, we we also mentioned, I think, in the last episode, uh, the the winner for the Designers Nest Award, the Buram Yu, very very expressive, very very interesting. Uh, uh, um, you know, look of things. Is is that your impression as well? Just overall from from the collections. Yeah, I will say so. I think in general, like, I mean, they were mixing, you know, you could see this candy in many mm. of the brands, but you also you could see that there's like a boldness behind, like a lot of strong colors and strong prints. You could see that also, you know, for instance, Division that does upcycling a lot. They have really, really strong looks. Uh, and I think also like they kind of defy the ideas of gender a lot because all the clothes are very wearable for both, uh, well, for every gender, every, every gender. So I think... Uh, you could see that all the brands are, are, are kind of dwelling in this kind of expressiveness and this boldness and this, uh, I th and I think it, that's great to see. I think it was a mm. lot of color and, you know, there was of course a lot of black and a lot of browns and a lot of grays that are very scanty colors, but you could see this like all the colors popping up in every collection, basically in every collection. Mm. So I think it's, it's a trend right now to, to explore that kind of expressivity within the brands. And it, it won't be Scandinavian Mind podcast unless we mention the the only crypto th sort of a, a thing happening, uh, which Division is, is doing an NFT together with uh, Adidas. Uh, what do we know about that? Well, basically, they have designed one NFT that is basically a, a little alien called Aussie. Mm. Um, and he's dressed in Division clothes with like a bomber and some pants and some little sneakers. Very cute. Um, and they made 25 units of this NFT. Mm -hmm. But furthermore, what they did is uh, for the attendees of the physical show, they uh, gave away 10 of these NFTs. So they, they encourage people to like uh, sign in in the, in the contest, so to say, so they can win one of the NFTs. I don't know actually who won anything, but they have the rest of the 15 NFTs uh, to, be, to be sold. And actually, I subscribed to the newsletters of Division, so I got recently the email about that. And basically, it's kind of private. They want to keep it like in a small scale for people who actually follow the brand. So you could like uh, bid to buy the NFT. Uh, and the winners uh, that, uh, and the owners of the NFTs can also will get physical products up for up to like 850 euros. So it was actually a really good deal if you got the NFT because the garments were really cool. <laughs> Well, you should try to get one. Try to get one and, and report back to us uh, what the experience was like with the Absolutely. Division NFT. <laughs> Anyways, thank you, Martina. Thank you so much for, for this report from Copenhagen uh, Fashion Week. Uh, um, it's been really interesting to see what's been going on. Thank you. All right. I thought we should take a moment to mention some of the things happening in Stockholm. Uh, this week. Uh, we, I'm sure we will do uh, a report similar to Martina's next week. Uh, I know our uh, colleague Yuan has been running around on presentations all week, uh, super stressed out, out of his mind actually, because it's both Fashion Week 
and Design Week at the same time, and we cover both. Uh, so I just want to mention a couple of things that have been going on, and something we haven't talked about on this podcast is that we, as Scandinavian Mind, has actually been the curators of uh, the Stockholm Design and Architecture Talks. So it's an extensive talks program that uh, is uh, created by the Stockholm Furniture Fair. Obviously, as pe- many people know, there is no furniture fair happening right now this week. They uh, have been postponing it to... Uh, uh, September, but the digital Stockholm Design and Architecture Talks is uh, uh, running on. And I think today's the last day they're doing it, and you can still buy tickets and, and view uh, all of the talks online for up to a month. And it's been really interesting uh, to be part of uh, of this process. We have a lot of uh, talks on things that are close to our heart, and, and we were actually invited to, to specifically uh, create talks on innovation and technology. So we have talks on uh, 3D printing. We have talks on uh, new innovations in, in traceability. We have talks on how to use waste as a business model. Uh, I've been interviewing Emma Olbersch and the uh, head of design at Polestar about what the designer's role in sort of fostering sustainability. So it's been really, really rewarding doing this. Uh, and uh, it's just a sort of a plug to mention that you can still uh, uh, buy tickets and, and view these talks of, um, a month from now. Uh, I also had a chance to uh, visit a dinner for Philippa K, who's doing kind of a, a relaunch right now. Uh, new CEO, uh, new designer, uh, really an international team. So it's going to be really interesting what happens with Philippa K in the months to come. There, there is no new collection from from the designer, but a, a new logotype, a serif logotype, which was uh, mm-hmm. uh, at least uh, something to see. Really contemporary. And we will see if Philippa K can, just like we saw at Copenhagen Fashion Week, if they can be a bit more expressive, you know, if they, if they were international, like you said, you know, like more crazy patterns and stuff. Because it can be kind of scaled down, right? Yeah, I mean, Flipper case obviously the the they're turning thirty actually next year. So it's one of the yeah. most iconic Swedish Scandinavian brands, sort of forerunner of this sort of very clean minimalistic Scandi style. And I think for the past year, it's kind of been struggling because there there have been quite a lot of new brands coming out doing similar things. Uh, so it's it's really interesting to see if this new team will be able to. Uh, um, uh, elevate that and somehow and then create a, a unique expression. I, I'm I'm hopeful. It, it, you know the the they said some really interesting things about what's going on uh, um, at the brand. So we'll see uh, what happens there. Uh, also, lastly, I just want to mention I uh, paid a visit yesterday to uh, Stockholm Fashion District, which is at the the trade show going on at Stockholm Fashion Week right now. And uh, this was the first day of lifted restrictions in Stockholm. Uh, so, uh, you know, not not as good as the timing in, in as in Copenhagen, lifting re- the restrictions before Fashion Week. We did lifted it in mid Fashion Week, uh, but it's really interesting. They had a little cocktail and DJ there, which they sort of scrambled together last minute to to make sure it uh, to celebrate the, the lifted restrictions. Uh, I also met a really interesting, uh, you know, in one of the corners. I couldn't help but but notice. Uh, a, f- a former student of, of uh, KTH, the, the Royal Institute of Technology, that had created 3D printed cosmetics. Uh, so it was a woman, a student there, uh, who had created a, a company called Allure, and she had a 3D uh, developed a 3D printing uh, machine for for uh, lipstick, which I was able to try and, and give to my wife. Actually, I'm not. Uh, I haven't tried it myself yet, but that, that's been really interesting. We're going to write more about that in uh, in um, the weeks to come. That's pretty cool. It's good. It's good to see that like innovation is not only on clothes but also on cosmetics. I think that that that's actually very interesting. Yeah, there's lots going on there. There's lots going on there, and in, uh, the next you know issue of Scandinavian Mind is going to be a huge focus on on new materials. Uh, new innovations uh, in the fashion industry like that. But we will also focus, I wanted to take the chance since we have Martina, you've been working on this story quite a lot uh, during your internship together with Eric uh, about researching digital fashion. And we're going to have a a big special about that in the upcoming issue of of Scandinavian Mind. Uh, So I wanted to take the chance when I got you guys on uh, to, to... uh, sort of a sneak peek into uh, w- what we've been writing about. So I know we've been working on this for, for several weeks. Anything that's been happening the last week that's been especially interesting? Uh, Eric, maybe you want to start? 
Yeah, so something new I've learned is, you know, we all know, of course, about digital fashion through gaming. We talked about it on this platform many times, but uh, I interviewed uh, Thomas Fenger, the chief experience officer, <laughs> which I thought was quite funny. It's a CEO, but a chief experience officer. <laughs> um, about on Synergy XR, they make like uh, XR meetings, you know, like business meetings. And, right, you know, right. we've seen Meta and we've seen Microsoft all launching their own platforms with this. And uh, what I wanted to ask him about is how do you dress these avatars, these Metaverse avatars for... So you step into this Monday meeting, you instead of pulling your face out there, you're going to have an avatar. So how do you dress them? And specifically, I wanted to ask him why they're always why they're always legless. They're always you know, floating torsos, <laughs> just walking around like ghosts, kind of. And he gave me some really cool insights in, on why that is, and uh, yeah, why you can't wear your favorite shoes to a metaverse meeting yet. Probably in why the future, but not now. I, I've also been thinking the same thing. I mean, because because you know that's I I think that use case is really interesting because when you talk to people about what you know how will this work? Well, we'll have you know virtual meetings. And that's like for me the first use case of fashion in a digital sense because people can envision like a Zoom meeting, but if you do it like in a virtual space, uh, the first people think about it is like how will I look? What 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 is my appearance look right? So it, it's kind of like the first use case of fashion. But now you're saying you're pointing out <laughs> that that they, we don't we're not gonna have pants basically in the metaverse. <laughs> no, not not for now at least. Uh... And he talked about how it's really hard to predict the movements uh, in joints. So imagine your wrists and your uh, your elbows and your knees. Uh, it can be really hard to know where, how much you're bending them and in what way you're bending and, and if you're turning them and stuff. That's what he said from a programming and a developer perspective. Is that perspective. the reason it's hard to add, like animate in real time the joints? Uh, that's that's what he said, and uh, I've seen. I think I wrote about from my uh, like top C I C E S uh, in, invention innovations. I wrote about this really cool Korean brand that made like a really small like full body tracker, so it actually works. So if you put your, if you bend just one knee and put the other knee out like a ballerina, it will actually do that. Because if you just bend, I think on these like hmm. if you just bend down, they would just assume that you're squatting or something. But they don't right. know exactly what you're doing with your joints. Could you sit down? You know, it doesn't. It, it, it's not that easy. But uh, so for now, you're gonna you're gonna <laughs> save some money by only buying like shirts. So no pants, no shoes, no socks. Not now, at least. So what are we talking like? Tank tops and gloves. Is that that the new metaverse <laughs> yeah. fashion? You should get yeah, you should yeah. get into that. Those are the garments that you should yeah, design. Yeah, invest in gloves and tank tops. And you're fine. <laughs> Super funny, <laughs> uh, Martina. You've been doing a lot of research on, on this topic, and and you know assisting Eric with this. What are some of the the you know takeaways that you, you've seen uh, in the digital fashion space? I think the interesting thing I find with digital fashion is that there's still a lot of like uh, mistrust on if it's actually going to be a thing. When mm. I speak to regular people that maybe it's not so digital focused. They really think like, oh, yeah, but who wants to buy a dress if you cannot have it in real life? But I think the people that actually consume these products is going to be people that actually is very involved in the gaming industry and in online digital platforms like, you know, Metaverse and uh, meetings and so on. And I think uh, it has sold out. I mean, when you look at what Fortnite has done, what other drops with other collaborations have done, they have, they have sold out. And people is investing their money in NFTs, investing their money on digital fashion. Uh, when they have collaborations and so on. So I think it's actually going to be a thing. And something I find particularly interesting with digital fashion is the way that it can defy physics, for instance, like the materiality mm. of the digital garments, allow the garment to work in different ways and to grab the body differently, what a normal fabric will do in, in, in material life, if my, one might call it so. So I think um, that gives also new possibilities of what you can do with the uh, materiality and the shapes and the silhouettes of the, fab of the garments. And I think that's actually pretty exciting if you think about, you know, if you take a picture for your social media, for the Instagram or whatever, and you're an influencer and so on, you can have crazy garments that in real life is not possible to have. And I think that's exciting to see. And people's going to see other people doing it, and we want to do it too. So I think it's actually going to take off very strongly in a near future, and you don't want to be the last one actually acquiring this uh, fashion, so to say. So I th <laughs> Because you don't want to be the last in fashion because you, you, are, you have to follow it. So I think it's actually going to work. We just have to see more people actually buying into it. But it's the same when you see like this digital influencers that are actually uh, 
like design in 3D. And, you know, Lil, Lil Miquela is an example of that. So I think people uh, is still following this uh, influencers even if they actually do know that they're not real people so i think there's a thing here going on that's going to grow and we just have to give it time yeah on, on, yeah. on that uh, defining physics note that's what people that are programming like these rooms metaverse rooms are saying the same you know if you're an architecture or you're an interior designer you don't have you don't have to worry about physics <laughs> you can just go crazy with it and just have things for hanging upside down and there's no logic same with the with the clothes like i said absolutely yeah, and I've been actually talking to um, uh, the one of the founders of Zoan, a Finnish uh, tech company that develops different metaverses. They were the first one creating like a digital version of a city. They did Helsinki uh, four years ago, and they recently launched their own metaverse called Cornerstone Land. They've sold their first sort of pieces of real estate as NFTs on Cornerstone Land, and we'll, we'll get back to, to, to this. We're doing an interview with her. She was actually also part of a panel we did for Stockholm Design and Architecture Talks this week about sort of digital, uh, uh, you know, architecture and digital uh, furniture. But she said something interesting uh, sort of offhand that was also, you know, related to what you guys are talking about is that we they need to work quite a lot on the portability of these types of stuff. So, you know, one of the, the famous use cases that people talk about when it comes to sort of uh, NFTs and, and, and different sort of virtual worlds in the future is that we're able to bring our you know own goods, our digital assets, our NFTs into different worlds. So if you buy a pair of uh, cool artifact sneakers, you can bring them into Sue meeting and then into uh, Roblox or Fortnite and then into uh, perhaps Cornerstone land. And what they're working on right now is actually how do you do that? Uh, because it, it sounds simple, it sounds cool, I'm bringing my stuff into di different digital worlds, but to actually do it is a, a completely different thing, and they're actually working on that, which I, I thought was really exciting. All right, guys, uh, you, know, you know we can talk about this forever, and we will do, and that's why we have this podcast. Uh, Martina, thank you so much for coming on and sharing your thoughts from Copenhagen. Uh, I'd love to have you on again. Uh, you will continue to do reporting for us, uh, which I'm really happy about. Uh, just uh, before we uh, close out, uh, Erik, uh, what are you looking forward to in the week to come? I'm, I'm going to try. I'm going to hang out a lot on Reddit, I think, because Reddit have... Uh, further develop their talks space, like their audio chat forum or All rooms, right. you know, kind of like, uh, uh, like, yeah, basically a clubhouse copy or a clubhouse killer because clubhouse is no more like we know, <laughs> basically it's on its no, dying No breaths. one remember. everyone tries to forget <laughs> clubhouse. We all yeah, hyped but, it a year ago and now we're like, no one's there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I um, it's gonna be cool to to try that and perhaps report a, report on it on in a week because they have this like uh, recording function so you can record and probably record your podcast in directly in the Reddit subreddit which is quite cool. All right, interesting. So Martina, what are you looking forward to in the week to come? What are you working on? Actually, I'm gonna assist to Digital Fashion Week New York uh, today. So right. there are going to be different panel discussions uh, on the t on the topic of the metaverse, on the topic of digital fashion and the and AR and so on. Uh, so I'm going to see how that looks like because we've been talking about a lot about the concept of fashion week and anyone can claim that concept now, like you mentioned uh, in last week's podcast. So hopefully it's going to be something that lives up to the idea of the fashion week and it's not another YouTube video that no one will watch like Eric said last week. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we'll revisit that topic for sure. I have a meeting this uh, afternoon actually about the cover story of the next print issue of Scandinavian Mind. I'm really excited about that. That will be the only teaser I'll give on that. Uh, this has been the Scandinavian Mind uh, podcast. Don't forget to sign up to our newsletter. Visit scandinaviamind.com slash newsletter. Uh, I'm Conor Olson. I've been here with Eric Sedin and Martina Tederbring. Guys, until next week, thank you. See ya. See ya, thank you.